It was uh, Kenneth Hahn Sr., who was our principal at the time. He was demonstrating various instruments, piano and stuff. He had a snare drum with a stand and a music stand right here. He had a metal, you know, snare drum and a music stand right here. And had the music stand there, snare drum, and he said to me, what he did, he showed me how to hold a pair of drumsticks and a quarter note. That made the biggest difference in my life. Five minutes. He gave me five minutes right here on this spot. And who would have thought that I was going to wind up being a, a drummer, running with Jimi Hendrix and Bob Marley and them imitating them, you know, writing music behind us. Who would have thought I was going to be uh, the drummer and one of the writers of Why Can't We Be Friends? Slipping in the darkness, world is together, all day music, spill the wine, running with Eric Burton. Who would have thought that? And this is where, on this stage, I did my very first concert, right here on the stage with my mother and father out there. <laughs> Charles W. Miller, who lived here in Long Beach and went to Long Beach Poly. He graduated in 1957, right around D. Andrews and them. He was a sax player. That son lowrider, Charles W. Miller. This show that we're doing uh, this weekend, I want to you know, contribute, to, you know, make known that he is a homeboy. Like we say, Long Beach, homegrown. <laughs> Art of War, the very um, he was Our first album, hit album was Eric Burton declares war. Okay. And that's when we did Spill the Wine. A big shout out to Eric Burton. Yeah. He actually, we did the music, and he really wrote all the lyrics, but he gave us the writers on that. Eric Burton is like a big brother to me, along with Charles Miller. And that was our opening. Eric Burton declares war is when we got our first hit, and then we started touring. And as we toured with Eric, there was a lot of people we used to hang out with. Uh, uh, and then Jimi Hendrix be hanging around us. I remember a story I like uh, telling people about. The night before he made his transition, the last time we actually got a chance to be together, the day before that, him and I was in Soho, right behind Ronnie Scott's there in London. We're walking down an alley, and he's walking, had his floppy hat on, he's right in front of me, he says, come on, Brown, I'm going to show you how to eat when you get to Europe, London. He says, come on, Brown. I said, where are you taking me? He says, I'm going to go show you something. Him and I went down a little basement restaurant there in Soho, and we had, he turned me on to chicken tandoori, Indian food. Mm -hmm. And that was soul food. Because <laughs> yeah. I you know, with the chutney and the peas and the gravy, and the, you know, I still cook like that to this day. So we got there, you know, we had that, then that night, we went and played our gig. And the next night at Ronnie Scott's, which I think was about September 17th or so, September 16th, possibly, of uh, yeah, that year, we were on stage. And we were on stage playing. We was on stage jamming. And I'm playing. Stay up there right there. You can wait for me. I'm not going to leave you. <laughs> we, were doing, <laughs> we were doing it. I was play, I'm on the drums playing. And I'm going. Da, 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 da. And Jimmy's standing on my left ear, on my left shoulder. Yeah, Brown. Right there, Brown. Right there, Brown. And I can look and see his fingers playing on, right over my floor top. And I said, wow. So then we split that night. You know, everybody left. And, you know, recording of that last jam. It's, it's uh, on YouTube somewhere. But we went on back to where we were. And about 4 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from Eric Burden that Jimmy had made his transition. He was no longer with us. But Jimmy still exists in spirit, you know, because that story seemed like I tell it numerous times, but it seemed like it only happened back a few years ago. Yeah. How time flies. I remember my father and him taking me up there on the uh, western, just south of Manchester, to the web. That was Big Mama Thornton's club. Hmm. I never forget, we pulled up along the curve, got out, and Big Mama Thornton was there, you know, wearing her overalls. 
She said, come on with me, boy. Come with me. And I said, okay. And I walked in the club, and she sashayed around those chairs. She went, whoo, whoo, whoo. And we went to the back room. And uh, she told me, she says, uh, come on in, boy. Ain't nobody going to bother you. I go back there. I was standing with her. When, when I heard on the radio, Johnny Ace is supposed to shot himself in the head. And um, we were standing there. And I spoke to Taj Mahal, and we was talking, and I started researching it, that there was rumors that she made a shot him in the head. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I've seen, heard different stories. But I do remember that night I was with her when I heard on the radio. She did carry a 22 pistol in her pocket, so I don't know if she was using me for an alibi or what. <laughs> Hashtag, it wasn't me. <laughs> I'm just a baby. <laughs> and I started my first business when I was 18. I had Hertz and Airway. I go over there, I got everybody to go over to Local 47, the musicians, you know, in, on Hollywood on Vine Street. Vince DeVere was the one that took us in. He liked the way we came in there, organized. And we started playing on the Sunset Strip. We were playing the Palladium, Gazzari's. Whiskey a go-go, Crush Velvet. Hmm. We were one of the first young black bands doing casuals with all ourselves as creators because when we were kids, we would be like a Jeffy's cocktail lounge on Avalon and El Segundo. And he used to tell us, you got to play what's on that jukebox. If you can't play what's on that jukebox, the people ain't gonna dance and mm -hmm. we can't sell our you know, booze or whatever to give them popcorn full of <laughs> salt and stuff, make them drink, I guess. And you had to draw the ladies in. And we started doing that, but what we did, if we was playing like Booker T and the MGs, one of those songs, uh, yeah, when they had that, yeah, Green Onions, or we was playing a James Brown or B.B. Or, or, or King, or whomever. So we would go all kind of ways with the music. So I got to say that that was a blessing for us because we learned how to create on the job. And that's why being creative is very important. 